Cold War Gadgets The Cold War was a time of espionage between the CIA and KGB and other organizations. Technology played a key role in an agent's inventory. Gadgets were well-disguised and portable. Some were even deadly. Now declassified, let's look at what gadgets a spy might have on them to complete their mission. The Bulgarian Umbrella This deadly umbrella had a hidden pneumatic device that could inject a small poisonous pellet containing ricin into the victim. The weapon was allegedly used in the assassination of Bulgarian dissident writer Georgi Markov on September 7, 1978, in London by the Bulgarian Secret Service and the KGB. Spy Shoe with a Heel Transmitter The KGB installed a microphone and transmitter in the heels of shoes to broadcast conversations containing sensitive information to a nearby monitoring station. The device was activated by pulling a pin out in the hollowed-out heel, broadcasting until the batteries ran out. The Glove Pistol Originally invented in World War II by Stanley M. Haight for the U.S. Navy as a concealed assassination weapon, the KGB later copied the idea for their own use. The pistol is activated when the user makes a fist and fires when the target is punched. The Lipstick Gun This weapon used a 4.5mm gun mounted inside of a tube of lipstick used by KGB agents. This outlandish gadget was often nicknamed the Kiss of Death. The Minox Spy Camera This camera was developed in 1937, but saw popular use in the Cold War by spies who needed to take photographs of enemy documents. The Minox could take 50 high-resolution pictures without reloading. The camera was small enough to fit in the palm of your hand and could be concealed in a disguised case like a hollowed-out shoe brush. The Disappearing Ink Pen Invisible ink pens were used by spies to write secret messages. Once the message was written on the paper, it would begin to disappear over a few hours. If the letter ever fell into the wrong hands, the evidence would already be gone. The Hollowed-Out Coin These coins appeared normal at first glance, but could contain microfilm or microdots inside. They were opened by inserting a needle into a tiny hole on the front. The KGB, who they were and what they did. The KGB was the chief government intelligence and security agency of the Soviet Union from 1954 until its collapse in 1991. The Soviet Union was made up of 15 republics, Russia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarusia, Estonia, Georgia, Kyrgyzia, Latvia, Lithuania, Moldavia, Tajikistan, Turkmenia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan. In some republics, the KGB didn't operate directly, but there were similar organizations that carried out the same tasks. The KGB consisted of two parts, intelligence services and military units that were totally separate from the Soviet armed forces. They operated as a completely independent government agency. And although the KGB marketed itself as the intelligence agency of the USSR, it was also a form of secret police, ensuring citizens all across the republic stayed in line with Soviet ideals, and political dissidence was dealt with quietly and often fatally. KGB stands for a Komitet Gosudarstvenoy Bezopasnosti which translates to Committee for State Security in English. The most famous former KGB agent alive today is Russian President Vladimir Putin. In March 1954, the KGB replaced the existing MVD that had been in place the previous year and had such well-informed and successful agents of espionage that Joseph Stalin knew far less about his own agents than those working for the UK and the US. Over the course of the war and beyond, Soviet intelligence agencies had thousands of international spies operating in dozens of countries, and at one point was the largest institution of its kind. But at home, they were uncomfortably compared to Germany's World War II secret police, the Gestapo. Political dissidents, those who spoke out about anti-communist ideals or against the government, frequently found their homes invaded and themselves arrested, at best. 
As the world headed into the Cold War, this only intensified with the KGB, monitoring both private and public opinions of Soviet citizens at home. After the war, waves of anti-communist sentiment spread throughout the West, heightening the tensions of the hardening Cold War between the Soviets, Europeans, and Americans. This was called the Second Red Scare, the first that occurred decades earlier between 1917 and 1920, and before the creation of the KGB. During this period, the Americans became aware of the volume of Soviet spies across the U.S., living both legally and illegally. They feared what these spies would do to their society and political ideals. This was a particular fear of Senator Joseph McCarthy, who spearheaded investigations that led to hundreds of accusations of treason and subversion. It's impossible to know the true number of victims of McCarthy's fanatical approach to rooting out Russian spies, but estimates place the number of those imprisoned in the hundreds, and it's predicted over 10,000 lost their jobs as a result of being questioned. Subsequently, over the course of the early 1950s, the number of Soviet spies across America dropped dramatically with the last major illegal spy, Rudolf Abel, being betrayed by his assistant in 1957. Nevertheless, at home, the KGB continued to tighten the reins on Soviet society. In the 1960s, due to a U.S. political dissident, John Anthony Walker, Soviet intelligence was able to decipher thousands of U.S. Navy messages, giving them a decisive military edge, should they choose to act upon it. The Hungarian Revolution of 1956 began with a protest by university students against the USSR, as well as their hardline Stalinist former head of state, Matyas Rakosi. Prague Spring began in 1969, when Czechoslovakia tried to assert its independence from the USSR by reclaiming political power back into its member state. On both occasions, the Red Army of the USSR was quick to act, invading the countries and shooting thousands of protesters and civilians to quell the uprising. As usual, the KGB quickly and quietly worked alongside the Red Army and USSR's other operatives to destabilize the revolutions. In Czechoslovakia, they infiltrated pro-democratic institutions to undermine political sentiments and reported back to the Soviet government. On October 29, 1956, in Hungary, a report by chief of the KGB, Ivan Serov, claimed inaccurately that armed groups were seeking out communists and killing them, as well as any state security officials they found. The Hungarian military leader, Paul Melita, responded by negotiating a diplomatic meeting between a Hungarian delegation and the USSR. During the midnight of that same evening, Serov ordered the arrest of the Hungarian delegation. The following day, after the removal of their leader by the KGB, the Soviet army attacked Hungary again. The uprising was quelled just seven days later, officially ending on November 11, 1956. After the uprising was over, Serov and the KGB continued to monitor Hungary closely, once again employing tactics to monitor any internal dissidents. By 1964, the head of the USSR, Nikita Khrushchev, had fallen out of political favor. He had denounced Stalin years earlier, a shocking move to the USSR, and had moved to eradicate Stalin's policies. This, coupled with his later handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis, led to other government officials and the KGB chief, Vladimir Simichesny, to plot his removal. Unlike most former heads of the USSR, Khrushchev did not meet an unfortunate end. On October 13th, when he landed at Vnukovo Airport, he was met by Simichesny and other heads of the coup, who took him to the Kremlin, with little resistance from Khrushchev himself. 24 hours later, the premier announced his allegedly voluntary removal from power. He spent the rest of his life in a house paid for and monitored by the KGB, who recorded his every word and all visitors who came to his house. Khrushchev spent his last years writing memoirs that the KGB tried desperately to get their hands on. In 1970, after he was hospitalized, the agency instead went after his son, who finally handed over his father's original memoir notes, having already successfully smuggled copies to a Western publisher, much to the KGB's dismay. In the 1970s, the KGB became more heavily involved in South Asia. They influenced political opinion across newly formed Bangladesh, starting in 1973 with the installment of the first president, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Initially democratic, just two years later, Mujibur formed a one-party state. 
The KGB's influence grew exponentially across the rest of the 70s, despite Mujibur's own reign coming to an abrupt end six months later, when he and most of his family were assassinated during a coup. This didn't slow down KGB influence in Bangladesh, however. By the end of the decade, the number of officials in the area had more than doubled, and they had printed numerous defamatory news articles targeting the newly appointed and West-friendly de facto president, Zia Rahman. The KGB were heavily involved in Afghanistan in the late 1970s. They had heavily influenced political leadership in the country and sought to control it by placing a puppet president in the leadership role. But they were thwarted when the second president, Hafizullah Amin, took control of the country. They found themselves less able to control and influence his leadership. He wrote memos in English and spoke regularly with the United States. Eventually, the KGB claimed he was an American spy and undertook the successful operation of Storm 333, where they assassinated Amin. Their actions marked the start of the Soviet-Afghan War. In 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. Over the preceding years, the states had become looser republics, eventually culminating in the complete dissolution of the Union, much to the distaste of the KGB. In August 1991, the chairman of the KGB, Vladimir Khrushchev, launched a coup against Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev, alongside other Soviet leaders. Their intention was to re-centralize Soviet power in Russia, removing the increased liberties that had been given to the Soviet states. Ultimately, two days later, they failed, and it marked the final end stages of the complete dissolution of the Soviet Union and the KGB themselves. What was the thing? The Cold War. On August 4th, 1945, a group of Russian schoolchildren from the Vladimir Lenin All-Union Pioneer Organization presented a two-foot wooden replica of the Great Seal of the United States to the U.S. Ambassador to the Soviet Union, Avril Harriman. Believing it to be a mere friendly gesture of friendship between the USSR and the USA as allies in World War II, the Great Seal was hung up proudly on the wall of the Ambassador's residential study in the library at the Residency Spaso House in Moscow. What the Americans didn't know was that this gift was holding a secret. This gift was not merely decorative. The Soviets had placed a high-frequency radio bug inside. This listening device, dubbed The Thing, enabled the Soviets to eavesdrop on confidential conversations of the U.S. ambassador. Surprisingly, the bug worked without batteries or electrical circuits. Instead, it was initiated when a radio signal aimed at its antenna from a van parked outside the building activated it. The sound waves from conversations within the office caused vibrations of the membrane inside the carving of the Great Seal, which beamed back to the surveillance van. This simplicity meant that the listening device had an almost unlimited lifespan and was difficult to detect. The thing was on display for seven years until it was discovered in 1952. In 1951, a British radio operator suddenly picked up a signal, accidentally overhearing American conversations while the Soviets were using the bug. The sweep didn't find anything. In fact, whenever major repairs were made to the offices, the walls were inspected for any concealment of bugs. The Great Seal was always taken away and examined, and then returned in place afterwards. A second sweep in 1952, provoked by another accidental overhearing of the ambassador's office on a radio signal, found the bug in the Great Seal. At first, the Americans were confused by the seal and didn't know if it was an actual bug because of its simplicity. But eventually, after analysis, it would lead on to a British version of the device. The discovery of the bug was kept a secret by the Americans until the U-2 incident in 1960, when the Soviets accused the Americans of spying. To show that both sides were guilty of this, the Great Seal bug was revealed during the meeting by U.S. Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge, Jr. How the Spartans purged the slave population. The Cryptea, the secret police of Sparta, ancient Greece. We have secret agencies and law enforcement in the modern age that enable states to spy on its citizens. We hear how threats to national security are neutralized and traced through electronic media. Impressive technological advances have made it possible. 
the need for this practice was always felt in ancient civilizations such as ancient Greece. The Spartans employed the same kind of methods to help keep the population submissive. This was done through the Cryptea, a type of secret police in Sparta. Sparta was made up of a huge helot population that served as slaves. They didn't live under the direct supervision of a Spartan, though. The helots were often assigned to do work that the Spartan citizens considered too low for their status. Due to a devotion to military life for every able Spartan male, tasks like farming were assigned to helots. They would often live independently and worked in communities for their Spartan overlords and were required to hand over a portion of their harvest. The Spartan citizens, in contrast, lived their life as warriors and were made to go through extensive military training that started as soon as they turned seven and ended when they were 30. This slave population was often concerned with the way they were treated and stood up in revolt against the Spartans. Slaves in most other civilizations worked directly under their masters. Spartan slaves, in contrast, worked together with each other independently. As they were located outside of Sparta, the possibility of slave unions and revolts were high. The Spartan military often had to fight them as time progressed, and they learned to contain these revolts. They developed a system of spies called the Cryptea that would see the signs of discontent and execute the dissident helots. Some of the training and conditions that the Cryptea experienced were that they were only allowed to sleep outside, they were to be barefoot in the winter, could only carry a dagger, and could only carry a limited amount of resources on missions. This was done to test the Cryptea and challenge them to be resourceful. With a limited amount of supplies, it was less likely that they'd be caught, and if they were, they could get away faster. This practice was gruesome, even for ancient standards due to the many operating procedures they followed. The Cryptea were allowed to kill or execute any helot who they found out to be a potential dissident, without the fear of punishment. Because the helots were state-owned, their killing was justified in the eyes of the government. Spartans not only killed the helots for sport, but also tortured and humiliated them. They would have the helots get drunk in order to show younger Spartans the dangers and embarrassment that would occur from drinking alcohol. Slaves in the other Greek city-states, such as Athens, were imported, while helots were born and raised in Sparta. Even neighboring city-states believed that the conditions that the helots were living in were terrible. An account stated that an Athenian said, In Sparta, the free man is more a free man than anywhere else in the world, and the slave more a slave. The execution methods of the Cryptea was covert and was kind of a state-sponsored assassination of people that spoke out against Sparta. It was an on-the-spot kind of killing. It may have been itself the cause of revolts, but the Spartans considered this method to be effective. The fear of revolts grew whenever the Spartan populations decreased during times of war, when Spartan men were taken away from the city. Many claim that the population of helots to Spartans was seven to one at some point in history. Some sources give even more harrowing accounts of the practice. According to those sources, Spartan rulers would declare war on the helot population every autumn, and the chosen cryptai would go to helot areas, killing any individual who was the strongest or capable, and would take their food. These young Spartans were able to kill any helots without punishment from that helot's owner. It was even alleged that the cryptai would go on a killing spree of helot civilians to hone their fighting skills as a practice. It doesn't seem it would have been a reality. Even if it was the case, it would have been frowned upon by the Spartans themselves. Not all Spartans hated and viewed the helots poorly, and some grew relationships and bonded with them, given that they would work in their homes and see each other regularly. The Cryptae were often armed with knives and did not have any heavy armament on them. Because it was a stealthy job, they would hide their weapons, observe the population, and kill anyone who showed signs of rebellion. If a Cryptae got caught during his mission, he was punished severely by the Spartans themselves, so stealth was the key factor. That made sure that the helot population would not even know the individuals who were behind those attacks. It also prevented an open war or reprisals. The Cryptae were chosen from the Agoge, the primary military training of Sparta, when they reached a reasonable age. They were chosen from the best of the candidates. Only those fighters who served as a Cryptae could hold important political or military positions in Sparta. The Cryptea acted as a military intelligence organization. Intelligence agencies of the modern age are similarly used to keep an eye on civilian populations. However, the Cryptea was a lot more violent, even compared to ancient standards. 
killing anyone without the fear of punishment was a recipe for tyranny. The Cryptea also played an important role in battle. The Cryptae would go behind enemy lines or to the flanks to promote disorder and gather valuable intelligence. Cryptae were also entrusted with reconnaissance. Not much is known about the Cryptea, and most of the information about the secret organization comes from Roman or non-Spartan sources that could have had a bias against Sparta and its Cryptea. There are not many primary Spartan sources that discuss the organization. To give a benefit of the doubt, we can assume that the Cryptea was not as bloodthirsty as some sources say, and it was not intended to execute random helots at will. Although it must have been used to curb dissent by executing the most outspoken helots, it would not have been in the interest of the Spartan government to incite hate amongst the helot population by killing random people. The Cryptea would have been a small organization, only used to prevent potential uprisings. Did the U.S. Marines serve in Europe in World War II? There were U.S. Marines operating in Europe during World War II. In fact, quite a significant number of them were aboard U.S. warships in the Atlantic and Mediterranean throughout the war, as well as large numbers deployed protecting American naval and diplomatic sites in the region. But far less compared to the hundreds of thousands that were involved in the many bloody island assaults of the Pacific Campaign against Imperial Japan. At first, the U.S. Marine security detachments in Europe were assigned to protect U.S. naval bases in the United Kingdom, so they were not involved directly in combat. But with the setting up of the intelligence agency, the Office of Strategic Services, this all started to change. As the war progressed, U.S. Marines started to assist the OSS covert operations in Nazi-held Europe in increasing numbers. At least 50 of them served as intelligence agents and saboteurs for the OSS. Though their missions were highly classified, one Marine stood out from the rest, and that was Peter Pierre Julian Ortiz. He was born on August 5, 1913, in the United States of America, to a French-Spanish father and American mother, but was later educated in France at the University of Grenoble. In 1932, at the age of 19 and hungry for adventure, he joined the French Foreign Legion and over the course of the next five years rose through the ranks to become an acting lieutenant. Ortiz was offered a permanent commission as a second lieutenant if he agreed to re-enlist for another five years and consider eventual naturalization as a French citizen, but he declined this offer and returned to the United States. In his first tour with the Legion, Ortiz was awarded the Quadruguerre Medal with two palms, one gold star, one silver star, five citations during counterinsurgency operations in Morocco against some rebellious local Berber tribes. He also received the Croix de Combattant, the Wissam Alouette, and the Médaille Militaire. When the Second World War broke out in Europe, Ortiz re-enlisted in the Legion in October 1939 and later got battlefield commissions, initially to second lieutenant and then to first lieutenant. In June 1940, during the Battle of France, he was seriously wounded and captured by the Germans. This came about after he returned from a mission, only to find out that a fuel dump had not been destroyed as planned. He returned to the area on a motorbike, rode straight through the German lines, and successfully blew up the fuel dump. But on his way back, he was shot in the hip. As the bullet entered his body, it hit his spine and left him temporarily paralyzed, making it easy for the Germans to take him prisoner. He spent 15 months as a prisoner of war in a series of POW camps in Germany, Poland, and Austria. He attempted a number of escapes and finally succeeded in October 1941 when he boarded a ship in Lisbon, Portugal that was bound for the United States. He arrived there on December 8th and was interrogated by Army and Navy intelligence officers. He was in a poor physical condition and had to recuperate before being able to pass the physical examination. On June 22, 1942, he enlisted in the Marine Corps and was assigned to boot camp at Paris Island. With his past military experience and bearing and his positive attitude, his potential was soon recognized by his superior officers, and he was given a commission as second lieutenant. Ortiz was sent to Camp Lejeune as a training officer. He was then ordered to attend the Marine Parachute Training School. Though Ortiz had already completed numerous jumps with the Legion, he took the training in his stride. The Legion had its way, and the Marine Corps had the right way. I never minded jumping, he said. Towards the end of 1942, Ortiz was posted to North Africa to assist with the upcoming Operation Torch. 
This was the American-British invasion of French North Africa, which was allied with Germany at the time. He so impressed his superiors with his actions that he was promoted to captain. Under the guise of an assistant naval attaché, which was only a cover, Ortiz took part in combat operations as well as reconnaissance and sabotage missions for the OSS. He was wounded again while carrying out combat intelligence work in preparation for this invasion. He and his patrol encountered an enemy patrol, and as a result of the firefight that ensued, in which Ortiz managed to drive them back with hand grenades, he was badly wounded in the right hand. Ortiz was evacuated back to the USA to recuperate. In 1943, when he was fully recovered, he came to the attention of the Office of Strategic Services Intelligence Agency, who were impressed that he spoke English, French, German, Spanish, and Arabic fluently, as well as several other languages. He became a full-time member of the OSS, and on January 6, 1944, he parachuted into France to aid the French resistance as a member of a three-man Allied squad initiating Operation Union 1. The other members of the unit were Colonel H.H.A. Thackwaite, a prominent British undercover agent and an experienced French radio operator named Monnier. He liaised with local resistance groups and organized for them to be supplied with weapons, ammunition, and equipment. During this time, he also led several successful raids against the German occupation forces, taking great personal risk as he was wearing civilian clothing at the time. This meant that if he was captured, he would have been handed over to the Gestapo and shot as a spy. However, he did carry his uniform with him during combat operations. Ortiz sabotaged rail lines, stole military vehicles from German motor pools, ambushed enemy patrols, and in one particularly audacious operation, walked into a German-run jail pretending to be a Wehrmacht officer and spirited away several captured British airmen. He led this group of RAF pilots to the safety of the Spanish border. For all this, he was awarded the U.S. Navy Cross, the United States military's second highest decoration that's given for valor in combat. He was also promoted to the rank of major. Although the group should have remained hidden during the day in safe houses, Ortiz couldn't resist wandering around the French towns in the late evenings. Apparently, he walked into a cafe wearing a long cape or raincoat over his uniform. Being fluent in German, he was able to understand a drunken group of German officers talking and cursing about him and the resistance, and what they would do to him if they caught him. Ortiz stood up, revealing his marine uniform to them, and pulled out a couple of 45 automatic pistols. One version of the story says he made the German officers raise a toast to President Roosevelt and to the Marine Corps, before the gunfire started and some of the officers were shot down, before Ortiz made his escape and vanished into the night. Another version says Ortiz didn't shoot anyone, leaving them alive to boost his legendary status and further erode German morale. As the Germans and the Vichy French offered increasingly higher rewards for their capture, Ortiz and Thackwaite were withdrawn from operations in May 1944. Ortiz returned to France on August 1st of 1944 as the head of Operation Union 2 where he continued to assist the local resistance groups in the area and continued to lead raids against the German forces. He was given command of a team that comprised five other Marines, Gunnery Sergeant Robert LaSalle and Sergeants John P. Bodnar, Frederick J. Bruner, Charles E. Perry, and Jack R. Reisler, Joseph Arcelin, a free French officer, and Captain Francis Coolidge of the U.S. Army Air Force. Unfortunately, Sergeant Perry was killed when his parachute failed to open. This operational group was a heavily armed contingent, which was tasked with conducting sabotage and seizing key installations to prevent the retreating German units from destroying them. They were always in uniform when operating behind enemy lines, and the Free French officer had carried false papers identifying him as a Marine. Ortiz and his group were discovered in the town of Centron by elements of the 157th Alpine Reserve Division and were quickly encircled on August 16th. A firefight ensued, with Ortiz and his men retreating from house to house, until the French civilians implored them to stop and give themselves up, so as to avoid reprisals on the town from the Germans if they had managed to escape. Ortiz and his men surrendered under the condition that the townspeople would not suffer any retribution from the Germans. They were incarcerated in the naval POW camp of Marlag und Milag, Nord, which was located in the small German village of Vestetimka, just outside of Bremen. Despite Ortiz being tortured and interrogated by the Gestapo, he revealed nothing. For this, he was awarded his second Navy Cross. 
His attempts to escape during the journey to the camp and later from the POW camp were unsuccessful. On April 10, 1945, the camp commandant ordered the POWs onto an enforced march out of the camp. In the confusion, some prisoners found hiding places in the camp itself. However, Ortiz was being watched, so he was included in the column. When the RAF attacked the column of moving Germans and POWs, Ortiz and several others managed to escape into the woods. They wandered for 10 days hoping to find the British lines. Since they were unsuccessful, they returned to the camp, where they found the remaining Allied prisoners had taken charge of the compound. And a few days later, his prisoner of war camp was liberated by the Allies on April 29, 1945. On top of his two Navy crosses, he was awarded many other military medals, making Ortiz the most highly decorated member of the OSS by the end of the war. His other decorations included two U.S. Purple Heart medals, the French Legion of Honor, which is their highest award, and the British made him an Officer of the Order of the British Empire, more commonly referred to as an OBE. By now, he had risen to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, and he was released from active duty in 1946. And in March 1955, at the age of just 41 years old, he was placed on the Marine Retirement List as a full colonel, and thus ended his military career. After the war, he did some work in Hollywood as a military advisor, as well as performing in numerous movies. And though some of these movies became huge hits, like the John Wayne classic western Rio Grande and the popular comedy Abbott and Costello in the Foreign Legion, he only ever had small parts as an extra, and by his own admission, he said that he was a terrible actor and it seemed more like a hobby to him than any type of career. Two Hollywood movies were made about Ortiz's exploits during the Second World War, 13 Rue Madeline in 1947 and Operation Secret in 1952. Peter Ortiz died of cancer on May 16, 1988, at the age of 74. He was one of the few Marines to serve on the Western Front and showed great courage behind the enemy lines and a devotion to his duty. The Secret CIA Museum, 1947 to present day. The Central Intelligence Agency, more commonly known as the CIA, or informally as the agency, is the U.S. intelligence service that's in charge of gathering sensitive foreign information and carrying out covert operations abroad. The CIA was created in 1947 with the signing of the National Security Act by President Truman, and its headquarters are based at Langley in Virginia. A little-known fact is that inside this complex is a museum containing over 18,000 unclassified artifacts. The museum itself was conceived in 1972 by a request made by then-CIA Executive Director William Colby to commemorate the agency's 25th anniversary. Although it may also have been founded partly as a PR move, as protests against American involvement in the U.S. Vietnam War reached fever pitch, Walter Fortzheimer, an agent of the CIA's predecessor, the Office of Strategic Services, was tasked with choosing the artifacts. In 1988, the museum was finally realized. But as this secret museum is closed to the public, its role is more about encouraging recruitment for the agency, the preservation of historically significant items linked with intelligence, and to underline the successes of the agency while downplaying its failures. It also lends its artifacts to not-for-profit institutions such as public museums. The items very much focus on how the CIA has developed cutting-edge technology for spying and espionage over the years. The collection also showcases the more deadly and sinister side of espionage, with exhibits like the High Standard 22 Ultra Silenced Pistol. This gun was developed way back in World War II and was nearly totally silent, as well as being flashless. It used 22 caliber or 5.6 millimeter bullets with a 10 round magazine and was semi automatic. Though it did have some serious drawbacks, the chief ones being that the suppressor had to be cleaned thoroughly after every 50 rounds fired or run the serious risk of jamming, and the fact that it was an extremely cumbersome 14 inches or 350 millimeters long. It's thought that this weapon was still in service as late as the Gulf War in 1991. 
Right outside the CIA headquarters lies the 812 Oxcart. With early designs beginning in late 1957, it was intended to succeed the American U-2 spy plane monitoring the USSR during the Cold War. After a U-2 was shot down by Soviet Air Defense Forces in 1960, it was instead used to photograph strategic locations over North Vietnam and North Korea in 1967 and 1968. Flying over 90,000 feet in the air at a staggering Mach 3.2, over three times faster than the speed of sound, it dodged over a dozen surface-to-air missiles during operations. On the other hand, six of the 15A-12s that were constructed would be lost due to faulty mechanisms, and three agents would lose their lives. The CIA's Insectothopter, developed back in the 1970s, this intricately pieced robotic dragonfly, only one gram in weight, was crafted to carry an even smaller listening device that had been recently made at the time. The first insectothopter design was shaped like a bumblebee, but as it couldn't fly stably and would be noticed if it hovered for too long, it was swapped with the dragonfly model. With a tiny engine in its body to move its wings, it pushed excess gas out from its tail to propel itself forward. Based on the test flight recordings, it could fly as far as 600 feet or 200 meters, and for as long as a minute. But because even a noticeable amount of contrary wind would set it off course, it would never be used operationally. The CIA also developed a robotic catfish nicknamed Charlie, an unmanned underwater vehicle. It was constructed to potentially carry out clandestine water sampling missions behind enemy lines. Storing water into its body, it could bring it back to a lab to check unfamiliar waters for any harmful or novel substances. Charlie was very much an experimental design that relied on a radio handset to control it, much like radio-controlled boats in today's public parks, but created 30 years ago and underwater. It had a pressure hull just like submarines possess to stay afloat, a ballast system to allow water inside and out, as well as a propulsion system in its back for it to swing its tail. It's not known if the CIA did any further work on developing this rather unusual concept. Some items displayed at the museum are truly novel and extremely bizarre, for the CIA used things like false rocks or fake hollowed-out trees to house communications between agents and their handlers. On some occasions, the CIA would even use real dead rats to conceal messages in and would sprinkle Tabasco hot sauce over them to discourage cats from savaging these corpses. There are also some CIA war trophies on display here at the museum, like a throttle control cable from a North Vietnamese AN-2 Colt biplane. On the 12th of January 1968, four Colts had been assigned to bomb a remote mountainous U.S. radar facility in Laos, which was extracting weather data to time American bombings of North Vietnam. During that cool, dry afternoon, CIA flight engineer Glenn Woods and pilot Ted Moore coincidentally were flying back to the radar facility to supply ammunition. Woods fired at two of the Colts with his AK-47 from his unarmed helicopter, causing two biplanes to crash and the other biplanes to retreat. A few important items displayed at the museum are very much there for public relations purposes and for historical reasons. For instance, to mark the 2011 killing of the terrorist Osama bin Laden in northeast Pakistan by Navy SEALs, there's displayed what's believed to be his own personal rifle, a Russian AKMS assault rifle. Among other items on display at the museum are concealed bugs, ingenious gadgets, and many lethal weapons. These all give a valuable insight into the world of spying. As for the FBI, they run a restricted tour of their museum in Washington, D.C. People who wish to visit there must book at least four weeks in advance, be an American citizen or green card holder, and pass FBI security vetting prior to being issued with their tour tickets. 
The museum looks at the FBI's historical involvement in combating domestic terrorism, organized crime, and their involvement in high-profile criminal cases like bank robberies and missing persons. It also features an FBI historical 10 Most Wanted list, with such past wanted subjects as David Sylvan Fine, an 18-year-old peace activist who took part in the 1970 bombing of an army research center that killed a researcher there. He spent five years on the Most Wanted list before being captured in 1976. Another example of an intelligence-themed museum is the U.S. Army Military Intelligence Museum in Fort Huachuca, Arizona. They have on display there a genuine World War II-era Nazi Enigma code machine, at one time one of the most secretive devices in the world. The stories and artifacts from the CIA, FBI, and U.S. Army museums evidently act as effective promotional institutions. The CIA museum, for instance, despite requiring restricted access, still receives tens of thousands of annual visits from agents and invited guests. According to the CIA Museum's former curator, Tony Hiley, every new CIA officer is provided a tour on their first day, and possible recruits find themselves eager to join after being allowed a viewing. Nevertheless, for everyone else, it will remain a museum you will never visit.